The word embolus was first invented by Rudolf Wirchow in 1848 to describe the objects that lodge in blood vessels and obstruct the flow of blood. An embolus can be defined as a detached, intravascular, solid, liquid, or gaseous mass that is carried by the blood to a site distant from its point of origin. It is important to keep in mind that most emboli are derived from a thrombus somewhere in the vasculature. Hence the name thromboembolism. Rare forms of emboli include fat droplets, nitrogen bubbles, atherosclerotic debris, also known as cholesterol emboli, tumor fragments, bone marrow, and foreign material. Regardless of the type, the major consequence of embolism is obstruction of small vessels, leading to ischemic necrosis of the affected organs. So, in this video I'm going to discuss about the types of embolism, including pulmonary embolism, systemic thromboembolism, fat and bone marrow embolism, air embolism, and amniotic fluid embolism. In pulmonary embolism, emboli get lodged in the pulmonary circulation. And in more than 95% of cases, pulmonary emboli originate from deep vein thrombuses. However, it is important to note that deep vein thrombuses do not embolize in every individual. Emboli detached from DVTs reach inferior vena cava to enter into the right atrium and right ventricle. And then they enter into the pulmonary circulation during systole. Depending on the size of the embolus, it can occlude the main pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery bifurcation, these are known as saddle emboli. And small branching arteries. Frequently, there are multiple emboli. And a patient who has had one pulmonary embolus is at high risk of having more. Rarely, if a patient has interatrial or interventricular septal defect, emboli can pass through the defect and gain access to the systemic circulation. These are known as paradoxical emboli. Now let's see some common clinical manifestations of pulmonary embolism. Most pulmonary emboli are clinically silent because they are small in size. Obstruction of 60% or more of pulmonary circulation may result in sudden death. Right heart failure, also known as core pulmonale and cardiovascular collapse. Obstruction of medium-sized pulmonary arteries may result in pulmonary hemorrhages, but usually does not cause infarctions because the lung has a dual blood supply. However, obstruction of small end arteries may result in hemorrhage or infarction. Generation of multiple emboli with time can cause pulmonary hypertension and edema, which ultimately leads to left heart failure. Systemic thromboembolism refers to emboli in systemic circulation, about 80% of them arise from intracardiac mural thrombi. Thrombi occurring in heart chambers or aortic lumen are called mural thrombi. Others arise from thrombi in aortic aneurysms, ulcerated atherosclerotic plaques, and fragmentation of valvular vegetations. Major sites of arterial emboli are the lower extremities and brain, with the involvement of intestines, kidneys, and spleen to a lesser extent. In contrast to pulmonary embolism, the major consequence of arterial embolism is ischemia and infarction due to obstruction of blood vessels. Fat and bone marrow embolism refers to the embolization of microscopic fat globules with or without associated bone marrow elements, commonly seen in fracture of long bones, trauma to soft tissues such as adipose tissue, and burns. These emboli commonly get lodged in the pulmonary circulation. But, majority of people with fat embolism are asymptomatic. Symptomatic fat embolism is called fat embolism syndrome, which is characterized by pulmonary insufficiency, neurologic symptoms such as delirium and coma, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. In air embolism, air bubbles within the circulation can obstruct vascular flow and cause ischemic injury. Air can be introduced to the circulation during surgical procedures, such as bypass surgery neurosurgery, and obstetric surgeries. A particular form of gas embolism, called decompression sickness, occurs when individuals experience a sudden decrease in atmospheric pressure. Scuba and deep sea divers, underwater construction workers, and individuals in unpressurized aircrafts in rapid ascent, all are at risk of developing this condition. When air is breathed at high pressure, such as in a deep sea dive, increased amounts of gas are dissolved in blood and tissues, particularly nitrogen. When the person ascends towards the surface rapidly, air comes out into the blood from its dissolved state and embolize rapidly. And, size of the bubble also increases when the person gets closer to the surface. Recall Boyle's law you have learned in physics and chemistry.
rapid formation of gas bubbles within skeletal muscle and joints leads to a painful condition called bends. In lungs, air embolism causes edema, hemorrhages, and emphysema, and ultimately lead to a form of respiratory distress, called chokes. Chronic form of decompression sickness is called caisson disease, which is commonly seen in people working in pressurized vessels. Persistence of gas emboli within the skeletal system leads to multiple foci of ischemic necrosis. Femoral heads, tibia, and humerus are the commonly affected sites. Acute decompression sickness is treated by placing the individual in a high-pressure chamber, which serves to force gas bubbles back into solution. Subsequent slow decompression permits gradual exhalation of excess gas via lungs. Amniotic fluid embolism can occur during labor and immediate postpartum period. Although incidence of amniotic fluid embolism is rare, it carries a high mortality rate. The underlying cause is infusion of amniotic fluid or fetal tissue into the maternal circulation via a tear in the placental membranes or rupture of uterine veins. These emboli mainly get lodged in the pulmonary microvasculature, which is characterized by the presence of squamous cells shed from fetal skin, mucin derived from fetal respiratory or gastrointestinal tract, and lanugo hair, which is the first hair produced by the fetal hair follicles. Clinical manifestations of amniotic fluid embolism include sudden, severe dyspnea, cyanosis, shock, pulmonary edema, neurologic defects such as headache, seizures, and coma, and disseminated intravascular coagulation due to the release of thrombogenic substances from amniotic fluid. Okay. That's all I wish to discuss in this video. Thanks for watching.